that join together both the materials, chemical, and platonic sides of this, and everything <coughs> really should look nice. And there should, in particular, be a nice level set in general, have multiple solutions, right? On the little haystack, there could be multiple extrema of or disjoint, disconnected extreme at the top that's not excluded. So what we'd like to do is tech, test the predictions of this, this isn't the theory again, I'll say a principle, uh, in simulations and, and experimentally. Um, there's actually only two experiments that have really, on the laser side, addressed this issue. Both of them are affirmative, but there's more things to test. I'll show you one of them later on. Fourier series 
and the controls <coughs> are actually just a bit. Okay, I, I probably rub my finger across the wrong view here every time I touch it. Um, okay, there are M controls, series of M terms, as these phases. This A of T is just an overall Gaussian function of this fixed. And F is the coefficient in front, which ultimately will be a variable too. So F controls the amplitude or over the energy, the square of the energy of the pulse. So let's fix F and let's just vary the M controls. And um, what happens? Well, if M is large, you kill it again. You just stay to stay. Climb to the top, no constraints. Made it. But here we have n equals 3. Three states are going from 1 to 3, and m equals 4 controls. Not many controls in this expansion. God, this is terrible. Um, if I just touch my computer, it goes bad. So 40% of these got stuck. Well, if you look at this uh, a little more carefully statistically, What's plotted here? Let me go to the next key. So what's plotted here are the number of controls expressed in terms of the number of Hilbert space states. So the number of controls needed to avoid traps depends on n. And you'll note there's a break here, right? At 2n minus 2. And when you get to 2n minus 2, you're climbing quickly, such this is not a yield, but the fraction that make it to 0.999. So at, at 2 n minus 2, about 60% make it. So where does 2 n minus 2 come? Well, if you look very carefully at the gradient expression that we had yesterday, I'm not going to go back to it, you can show that the gradient can be rewritten in terms of, to show that the gradient can be expressed in terms of up to 2 n minus 2 basis functions of time. Those basis functions are not simply trivial cosines. They depend on the physics of the system, but they exist. And there's another relation with 2n minus 2, as you'll see a little later. If you go to the top of the landscape and look at the Hessian, remember the spectrum of the Hessian is important, you can prove there's no more than 2n minus 2 negative eigenvectors, 2n minus 2 eigenvectors that are ways off or to the top. So this 2n minus 2 is not an accidental number, and so it tells us good to operate with at least that many controls with these wisely chosen controls. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so why are the A not, cannot the A's be controlled parameters? Oh, it could be. It could be. It could be. So how do you know, I guess it's a philosophical question, uh, how do you know that you have a full set of control? You, you never know. You never so know. in fact, what we want to do here is we want to shackle ourselves. Okay. So what I was saying at the beginning, we just, uh, digitize the control field, no right. A. No, no, I know how you do it in experiments. I was just... No, no, no. It's, more it's, it's a simulation. Let me speak separate. Right. So the simulation, the first thing I showed you was, we just said the electric field at every point in time is a free variable. We had a thousand variables. Anything it wants to do. This is, and if that wasn't enough, we'll make 10,000 variables. Okay? And in fact, when we did these simulations, there's well over 100,000 of them. Okay. Out of the gate, you know, we set the number of variables and out of the 100,000, maybe 500 of them got stuck. And the usual reason was actually not the number of variables, um, but the numerical calculations needed to be refined a little bit. And as soon as we did that, those went up to the top, too. And you go into the lab, this is a very fundamental issue. We don't know the right basis functions to use in the lab. The lab is set up as an engineering process that uses pixels in the frequency domain. There's no reason to believe those are a good set of variables physically. Okay. Okay. And so people are doing all kinds of guessing games. And in, I mean, it's not a matter of right or wrong. So people sometimes loudly say, you know, my basis is the right one to use. Well, maybe for some problem, but we don't, there's no general answer to this. Okay. But theoretically, right. you can show that there's an existence statement. There are good basis functions. But unfortunately, they are physics dependent. So what do we get away with here? With you know, take a simple system like this, and you pick a, a, a radiation which is resonant or closely resonant with the transitions. You're, you're in the right ballgame. So take freshman spectroscopy; it's okay. If you really want a high precision results, you need to be more careful than that. Okay. Thank you.
Other questions? So once again, we've gone backwards here a moment. <laughs> yes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at a system just with n equals three states, going from one to three, and n equals five controls. Now f is going to be an additional control, but right now we're going to freeze it point one, uh, and we have five controls. Now I'm in a five-dimensional space, so I can't plot it for you. You're going to have to trust me. Uh, we, so five is one. That's 2n minus 1, so it's 1 above the critical threshold, but some of them make it, and so we're only going to look at, we're going to start on a trajectory that climbed up to the top for five or six knots. And then we're going to start pulling back on, on the constraints, on, you know, just putting, pulling on the constraints to see what happens. So before, what I'm going to first show you is what happens is you climb to the top, and these two dots, the green and the red, are on the top of the landscape five or six times. And we're going to take a drive across the top of the landscape. Now, how do we do that? We have access to the hash of the first derivative is zero at the top. And there indeed are no more than two n minus two, here's four negative eigenvectors, or eigenvalues. We then make a projector such that the electric field as we drive across the top, projects only into the null space at the top. In other words, one minus the projector into the eigenvectors that take you off the top. So we want to drive from the top and not come back. So this is in five dimensions. You're going to have to trust me that this trajectory I'm going to show you at the top stays here, and I can show it to you in three dimensions. Hopefully this will be played. So we take a walk. Pardon? It's on the projection screen. The cursor's on the screen. Ah, I see it. Unfortunately, I don't see it. Ah, do I see it? I can't see it on my screen. Oh, oh can you play the button right there? Down. 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 Ah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So if I had implied the bumblebee, I'd play it for you here. Uh, this red dot is staying at this fidelity. Okay, it's driving across the, lands the landscape. So I call it a wandering projector. And we you know proof, but we believe it'll wander forever. Never crossing itself. And it shows how rich and complicated these, these landscapes are. And it'll stop in a moment. Uh, and uh, exhaust it ourselves. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, that was at point one for F. I'm going to start pulling back on F a little bit. It's a resource. <coughs> see what happens. Okay, so let's pull back on this F factor, which is related to the energy. And what I just showed you at point one was this endless monitoring trajectory. Now we're still at the top, 0.999 times. But that trajectory now is closed. It's an orbit. Or you got to work at the top. Perfect solution. And I'm going to pull back to point 0.083. And you can see it fractured. Still at the top. I'm going to go back. 0.085, closed orbit. 0.083, fractured. 0.08, fractious, these fractured. 0.078 shrinking. 0.077, this shrank to a point at the top. 0.076, this shrank to a point. This is shrinking further in size, still at the top. 0.074 shrinking. 0.072 shrinking. 0.071, this is a point. Now remember, this shrank to a point at the top is 0.0. 77. This became a point at the top of 0.076. So let's look at 0.076. So at 0.076, this just shrank to a point, still at the top. This is an orbit, closed orbit, still at the top. But this point, which shrank at 0.077, is now pulled away from the top. And it's not much, but it's already beginning to pull away. And so what we see happening, we think it's 
probably generic to true. It has nothing directly to do with the fluence. Any critical resource, if you're at the boundary, you start pulling back, the top of the landscape will start fracturing into pieces, shrinking, and pulling away. And you'll, be, you'll see traps. Now, these are artificial traps. <clears throat> false traps because they're simply due to constraints on resources. But if you go in the lab and you use all the resources you have, you wouldn't know what's real or what's false. But the message is try to unleash the resources. Okay, are there any questions about that? Okay. So let's look at experimental control landscape chemical reagents. I know chemistry guys are shuddering, but okay. <laughs> so, um, what do chemists do? Uh, I may embarrass the chemists in the room. Probably not in here. Are there chemists in this room? No. <laughs> but if I was giving this talk, we, we have our standards. Pardon? <laughs> we have our standards. <laughs> yes, I know. So, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, there's uh, a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Escapes me right now, but there's a quote floating around the literature. You can go Google it. Find it. He said, "Chemistry is about getting lucky." <laughs> and of course, very embarrassing statement. If that's all that it's about, and, you know, but it's not. Okay. So, what do chemists do? I'm going to boil it down to kind of two things. In the end, they either make things and try to do it optimally, make chemical molecules, materials, or they're optimizing properties of something. That's basically in the end do, and everything in this room, including this, has something to do with chemistry. Everything in this room, and chemistry is widely, widely successful subject, the chemists make all kinds of things, and they measure all kinds of properties, and it's a vast literature, but what we looked at in that vast literature took a long time to find to mine the literature, <coughs> the papers where people did these things, and oh, by the way, measured enough points on the landscape, either for optimization properties or synthesis yield that we can see in the landscape. And in the literature over the last 20, 25 years, there's hundreds of papers like that. And what we found was statistically 90% of those landscapes in the chemical literature have no traps. 10% do, but none of the papers, one way or another, whether they have traps or don't have traps, say anything about it. Because individually, there's no reason to say it. But that's rather stunning that 90% of these landscapes in chemistry have no traps. So let me show you some. So this sounds awful. Right? Object, max my yield there, I'll put a real range on that right, right, right. So uh, what is it? It's not that bad. So um, these guys, uh, I have nothing to do with these chemistry tests. I'm recording them. But you see what happened. They took this molecule and they closed off the ring. Okay. Important thing for them. And in the seven dimensional space, and this is a picture taken out of their paper. And in fact, the paper says they had 10 to the 7th point. This was done with a robot. Their machine was done 10 to the 7th experiments, and they did about 300, and they nailed it. Nailed it in chemistry is 85%. You know, let's be gentlemanly about this. You don't know, look for five times. Uh, and then move off to the problem. This is considered really an excellent result. And this is the landscape they showed in this paper with respect to two variables. And there are no traps here, that's the top. Uh, it's just an example. Now another thing chemists do is make catalysts, well, it's solid state catalysts. They're materials made of multi atomic, multi-atomic components, and they, the catalyst tries to accelerate reaction. So these people were interested in the selective oxidation of what's called isobutane, it doesn't matter what it is organic molecule, they wanted to selectively oxidize it and produce a molecule called methatrolium. But they in fact reported three products, methatrolium, isobutene, and CO2. So this catalyst was exposed to the, the substrate it's called isobutene, it's oxygen, and they recorded three signals. It's just like going into the quantum control lab and saying, oh, I apply a laser pulse to something, and there's three products, I'll measure three signals. So they get three landscapes. The landscapes are a function of the atomic composition, which consisted of molybdenum, vanadium, and antimony. So the controls 
are the fractional content of molybdenum, vanadium, and antimony. They don't use that language, but that's what we translate it. And this is yield from a methacrolein versus composition because there are three components and they're fraction as of one, you get a triangular region, and this is isobutene and CO2, and, and the thing that's striking clearly is there are no traps. And in fact, there's broad level sets in these two products, which is consistent with what the landscape analysis would say. So in this same paper, these people changed antimony to bismuth. So now they have molybdenum, vanadium, and bismuth. And you'll note that this case stands out because now there are two suboptimal traps. And this is a perfect example in this chemical context. It does make a difference which basis sex functions you pick, so to speak. And this is not a good one. And you've got to know the chemistry to know what to do. But here, here's an example of this. And they would have been better off. In fact, one of the conclusions of this add more variables, making it four dimensional, they would have been better off. So now, what I want to do is jump to a different class of molecular problems, and which raises an interesting mathematical issue and brings in the landscape theory, finally, from what we've learned about the quantum control story to translate it into here. And this concerns problems in chemistry where the variables are discrete. And chemistry is, is generally a very discrete character to it. People talk about methyl, ethyl, bromo, butyl. Those are discrete things not a continuum in between them. And the other aspect of this is rules. So chemistry, this is an old subject, and there's a lot of people in it. And uh, you'll see, for example, the Smith rule. Just made up the name. What happens is Mr. Smith, who's a very clever guy, observed the experiments of many, many other people, and he realized, gosh, if you do this a certain way, something specific happens, and it becomes a rule. People love rules. And don't stick your nose up is about chemistry because the physics and engineering community loves rules too. Uh, science and engineering ultimately wants rules, rules of thumb. And chemists have just been at it a long time. So let me talk through this. Don't it looks complicated for you, you're not a chemist, but it's not that bad. First of all, this is work from 1970 and done by many chemists, and some guy who wrote this paper observed the collected results. So what's going on here is this is called a substrate. It's a molecule. It's a substituted methane. And X is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. It's called a substrate. And it's going to be attacked by what's called a nucleophile. A nucleophile means it's something that loves the nucleus, likes to go towards a positive charge. And there are the nucleophiles. It's going to attack this molecule, bond to it, and throw out the X. And this is the log of the rate of that reaction versus some sequential ordering of these discrete nucleophiles and discrete substrate. So chemists playing around with this for many years and culminated with this paper in 1970, realized you could order. Actually, the paper with this data didn't make this plot. They had a table of data. We just plotted it. And this wonderful landscape comes out. And they ordered this in a very specific way in their table from weak to strong nucleophiles and from weak to strong breathing groups. Uh, chlorine looks like the leaf, iodine likes the leaf, as can say. But you can see there's, except for a few aberrations, basically a monotonic landscape here. And this is driven by knowing some rules. So what can one do if we don't know the rules of the game? And this is where chemists give up. Uh, they don't know how to make plots, and not. so let's just look at an example of this. So I'm going to jump to what seems like something <coughs> unrelated to the draws NMR. You guys know about controlling with your spins. So NMR is not usually expressed as a control subject. NMR is supremely useful as an analytical instrument. So NMR is useful for an analytical analysis, not making it. But uh, it's a subject of high importance, and, and the, the spectrum you get, uh, the NMR lines, are very sensitive to what the molecule is. And that's why it's good as an analytical tool. So let's just look at this series of molecules. This is ethylene. These are substituted ethylene. So X and Y are the control variables. 
And they are methyl, CN, acetyl, hydrogen, CHO, these 15 things. Discrete thing. And there's carbon 13 here. The NMR line, NMR transition, if we extend transition frequency of the carbon 13 depends on what X and Y are. That's exactly why NMR is a valuable analytical tool. By measuring that, you can tell the information about what X and Y are. So the game here is to make as few of these X and Y molecules as possible, measure the NMR chemical shifts, and see if you can estimate the rest. Now, why would one even care about that? Well, there is a, a little cottage industry of people doing this in NMR, but the real reason for why I'm showing you this is a larger problem. This is exactly analogous to the problem of discovering uh, molecules, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, where the people play this kind of game. They try to make, uh, synthesize large families of molecules and make the smallest families possible and estimate what the rest are and find the winner. It's a difficult game. So in NMR for this problem, people don't know the rules. So what we did is we just labeled randomly by integer here, X and Y, methyl is 1, just randomly, CM is 2, and potted it up. And what came out is this, not a surprise. It looks random. So they're <coughs> labeled by this arrangement, and the color is the NMR chemical shift, the signal. And white squares are squares that were not made or, or observed. So, as I just said, the real game here is, okay, we measured these colored squares, we know the values by the color, let's see if we could estimate, for example, the chemical shift of that white square. Well, it's not so easy, the colors around there are a little dispersed. So this looks difficult, because it's random. So let's go back to the landscape principle. And let's assume they're satisfied, that this is a well-closed problem, objective of chemical shifts well posed, and these are an adequate set of control variables. That says that really hidden under here should be a regular monotonic landscape. And the problem is we don't know the order, we don't know the labeling of the variables. So we can play a game that's like Rubik's Cube in two dimensions. The rules are you can permute the rows, permute the columns, and this is arbitrary square round. So we go to the computer with that data and play that permutation game. And that's what came out. That's exactly the same data. So you can see the labeling are different. So let me go back. I didn't know that. There we go. That's where we started. Ended up. Started, ended up. So now you can see, well, except for some noise, it basically is monotonic. And now the estimation of the y squares is very easy. Now there's dozens and dozens of cases like this in NMR, and in fact, in infrared spectroscopy now as well, and where these theoretical principles coming from really what we learned in the laser or quantum control side transitioned into chemistry uh, is beginning to have an impact. People are interested in this. Um, so, just a comment. So, let's go on. Now I'm going to jump back to the photonic radiation side. Okay. So, jump into the thicket here. This picks up on something I showed you yesterday. Remember, we said we are interested, we climb up to the top of the landscape, or the bottom, if you like, or anywhere, uh, where we're at a critical point, we're interested in the hash. First derivative is zero. So in this case, it's a PIF problem. We climb to the top. We have end states. I didn't actually show you this expression. I showed you a more general result with the density trace row O. But for PIF, that expression I showed you reduces to this. This is in the literature. It takes a while to derive it. This is the wave function at time t and time t prime. This is the time evolution operator. These are the dipole operators. After a little arithmetic, you can show that this expression reduces to this, where these functions are very complicated functions of dynamics, but you get a separable form for the Hessian. And there's no more than 2n minus 2 of these things here. 
there's that twin minus 2 again. And immediately, that tells us that uh, we have a, a phase of black and white prediction. But when you climb to the top of the landscape, you should not see any more than 2 n minus 2 negative eigenvalues. In fact, the analysis at the bottom is another expression. And that predicts there's only two ways off the bottom, no more than two. <coughs> Now, if you go to trace row all problems, these numbers change, but there are additional black and white predictions. They are uh, pure numbers. They depend on the initial state of the density matrix and the observable operator. They don't depend on the Hamiltonian, except to the degree that the Hamiltonian says the principles or the assumptions behind this are satisfied. So we can test this in the laboratory, and we did an experiment at Princeton on atomic rubidium vapor. It's a hot atomic rubidium vapor in a cell about 100 degrees Celsius. And these are the favorite energy levels of laser folks because these transitions from the ground state up to this excited state all lie within the bandwidth of the titanium sapphire laser sensor of about 800 nanometers. So we did a closed loop adaptive control experiment to climb up to this state, standard way, we're at the top, and then we statistically pecked away thousands of, of random slight variations around the nominal loss of control to generate a Hessian matrix, actually 80 by 80, a chunk of it. These variables are the pixels, the phase pixels on the pole shaper. And it looks like a workshop test. You know, we put in black and pulled it over, but it's not. This is a major session, and you sophisticated mathematicians, you're not chemists, of course, can diagonalize this in your head, I'm sure, right? Sure. Of course. Right. And tell me how many eigenvalues there are. Okay, well, all right. So we did what, that. With this session thing, why doesn't it have obvious features at the resonant wavelengths? The pixels are just. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, and so you have to look very carefully at this. And, um, this was a case of strong fields which obscured that. If you lower the field intensity, you'll see that very sharply showing up. 